putty has certain inputs that are required for great thriving. Just insofar as we wanted to grow a plant, we know we need good soil, water, sunshine. The body has a similar set of inputs that are dictated through what I call natural law. And natural law is the fact that all life on this planet is connected to the cycles and the human organism is the exact same thing. Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Lenny. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Lenny here. And I have, you know, I know it's just going to be so annoying. I got this healthy, fit doctor on that teaches people health. I know he's so frustrating. So Anthony, my joke with health, right, and, and understanding it is that, you know, do our eggs good or eggs not good? Is bacon good? Is bacon? We don't even know anymore. We're so confused. There's a new diet every five minutes. And I'm hoping that you and I's conversation can shed some light on the health journey and how people get going. Because I realize that, you know, all we really have in this world is if we don't feel good, then it is, is put into, if, if I'm not the best version of myself for my 50 employees, then they're going to feel that right? And, and vice versa. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about your story and we'll get started from there. For sure. Happy to be here. And I definitely will do my best to give people the clarifying information from what I've studied over the last three decades and, and what I've done with my clients. And I, and maybe we'll start with like the, the track record. I have two companies focused on health and fitness. One is called fit father project where we help dads primarily guys over 40 get fit and healthy and the other one's fit mother project. And we help the moms get healthy. And we've had over 70,000 people in over a hundred countries go through our programs. And I want to share that off the bat because one of the cool things about my life story is I, I have a lot of data from like real world, what works. So there's some weight to my recommendations. Um, but I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to be into health and fitness or to help moms and dads. It kind of started through a bit of tragedy. When I was growing up, I watched my own dad basically bust his butt to provide for the family and his health was on the back burner. And it was pretty scary when I was very young. One time dad fell out of bed and he had a grand mal seizure and we took him to the hospital and that was the night he was diagnosed with brain cancer. And so for my childhood, I watched my dad basically fight for his life and, and not have much of any health. I mean, chemotherapy, radiation, brain surgery, and he ended up dying when he was 42 years old. And I was nine when I watched that happen. And a devastating thing. I mean, it broke my heart, but it also taught me from a very young age how foundational health is as parents, as people who want to create things in the world. When we lose our health, as you said, you lose this fabric and foundation of, of everything. And so it inspired me to get myself personally healthy. I started strength training after my dad passed, and that was a way for me to heal and get stronger. Got into competitive bodybuilding, eventually into medical school with the mission of helping busy parents who want to do better, but oftentimes can't get a sustainable routine in place. This is what I help people do. Entrepreneurs, busy parents, I help them establish sustainable health routines so they can get healthy for themselves and their families. I love that. And, you know, going through that, right? Um, not the same, but the same. I, I love analogies. Like uh, I was in the hospitality food business and traveled, sold wine for years. And what people don't know about the best foods in the world for that country, right? France or whatever mm -hmm. is built from typically from poverty, from, from, from strife, from tragedy is, is built that thing. You had this thing happen into your life. And instead of it defining you, you know, you've used that, that situation to inspire and help so many people in their lives and not even to mention how many people they've helped in their life. And mm -hmm. it has to be so empowering to see this thing that was so hard for you as a kid, but then you took it and and look at the what I call the ripple effect of impact. Look at this this amazing thing that you created from it. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. It is super motivating. And I think one of the lessons that I've learned is we're all in this game of like alchemy, and that's transmuting one thing into another thing. And I think the the greatest bit of alchemy is to take our hard experiences and turn them into something that's great for ourselves at first, and then for other people. And if we really have that mentality then we can embrace every challenge in our life as an opportunity to, to grow and to create. And certainly, like, let's just be real and talk about what's happening in the United States. You know, right now we have 
of roughly 70% of the country is overweight, chronic health conditions, taking multiple prescription medications. We are the most distracted, stressed out. And like, we know health is important. There's no mm-hmm. lack of information. As you said, it's just like, we have people who are, are very sick right now and, and want to do better or people that just know that there's another level of like untapped optimization to get to. And so I am really excited about this conversation because I, I want to, I guess, maybe make a case for people to, to take their health even more seriously and to get to the next level of emotional connection to their health. And also we just need to steer the ship in a different direction because as, as fit fathers and fit mothers, when we can have healthier families, we shift the trajectory of the next generation. Um, and our health does affect every aspect of ourselves. You know, it's not just our physical body, it's our mental, emotional, and even spiritual well-being. In fact, the word health means wholeness, it comes from the old Germanic for wholeness. And like, we know when that area of our life's not handled, things just don't feel right for us. And I was a consultant and ran a health insurance company for, you know, two years, a couple of years ago. I really don't want to get into the American insurance sector, but I learned a lot from the data. And the one that struck me the most was there's a higher percentage of adult humans in America that are on two prescription pills than zero. And when I heard that, that was like, oh, wow. So you don't, you're taking the one pill, but then you need the other pill to yep. trans, you know, to go against the other. So we've just kind of lost, frankly, we've lost our way when it comes to health. And, you know, for me, when I was, you know, a functioning alcoholic for 20 years, like my workout routine was the way I started getting sober. My, mm-hmm. my 45 minute walks in the morning were my flag every morning. That's no matter what was going on, no matter the divorce I was going through, the business I, the job I got laid off, I had that. So at least I did that thing for myself. You know, is that kind of your advice to people to get started if they even want to start moving in the right direction with their health? I mean, for sure, like anchor points of daily movement are important, but I think there's a, there's a broader conversation of people understanding that the body has certain inputs that are required for great thriving. Just insofar as we wanted to grow a plant, we know we need good soil, water, sunshine. The body has a similar set of inputs that are dictated through what I call natural law. And natural law is the fact that all life on this planet is connected to the cycles and the human organism is the exact same thing. We need good fuel and nourishing food. And this is probably one of the bigger things, even more so than exercise, because food can either in today's day and age be amazing nourishing building blocks for healthy cells, stable blood sugar, good, good levels of vitamins and minerals for ATP production, or it can literally be poison. So food is foundational. Two, we need daily movement. And that is different than formal exercise. And unfortunately, our, our, our commercial culture has conflated the two things. If we look at the longest living cultures around the planet, these pockets of longevity, the centenarians on the planet, they're not doing P90X. They go out and they do gardening and they move and they have active lives, but they're spending time outside doing daily movement, accumulating steps. And now there's so much research now showing like the brilliance between that habit that you had with the daily morning walk, because it does so much more than just burns calories and gets your circulation and your lymphatic system going. It probably connected you with the sunlight and the rhythms, which helps regulate your, your circadian rhythm and your neurotransmitters. Um, it's, it's an, it's an anchor of, of something that's going to give you like just better neurochemistry that makes you feel wonderful every single day. And it's something you can kind of repeat and turn the gears on. So we certainly need daily movement. And I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking they need to do formal work- workouts when they don't have the other two in place. And then even more foundational than both of those is the sleep aspect. Like we need to be rested and recovered. And if we're not sleeping well or optimizing that, we're creating a improper neurochemical cascade where it's harder to lose weight. They put two groups on diets. One group misses sleep. The other group sleeps great. The group that misses sleep, they lose muscle. They lose less weight. They have higher hunger levels. They have higher insulin resistance. So I think we need to like look at the conversation about what to start first. Exercise is always like the thing that people jump to. I just need to work out more. And it's probably you need to establish a really sustainable nutrition routine. You need to get good sleep habits in place. And then you sprinkle in the formal workouts. And then you talk about supplementation. There's an order of importance. And if you get the order wrong, you're just kind of like pushing a giant ball uphill. And what's the reference point for that? Because the problem is we're being inundated with, this is the diet, pick up this book, do this, keto, all these different things. Um, You know, where does one even start to to kind of get a grasp on it? And then what's the mindset to look at it properly? Sure. Well, here's my take. And I guess we'll get into some more specific nutrition stuff. 
like the healthiest diets, regardless if they go down the weeds of like one way or another into like the religious camps of dieting, if you will, um, is going to be a mostly non-processed diet. So you're eating like foods that don't require long ingredient lists that weren't made in some factory. So if you were to go into a grocery store, it's all the stuff on the perimeter. It's fruits, it's vegetables, it's meats, it's eggs. It's, you know, could be dairy products. It's, it's just like the basic non-processed stuff. And on top of that, the next level is we need to stabilize our blood sugar levels and maintain insulin sensitivity. So insulin is a hormone secreted by our pancreas. When we eat carbohydrates, it, it, it shuttles our blood sugar into cells. We need to keep insulin levels very sensitive and we can't be spiking our blood sugar all the time. This does not mean you need to go on a super, super low carb restrictive diet to do that, but it does mean that you need to eat healthy foods and you got to get the processed sugars and grains out of your diet. And I think like, as I continue to go through this, we can make it more practical and talk about, well, what do you eat for breakfast? What do you eat for lunch? And like, how does the rubber meet the road with the plan? But basically non-processed blood sugar stabilized, our bodies need to have a balance between feeding and fasting. This is just wired into human physiology. We need to be an anabolic and catabolic metabolism. So this means incorporating some degree of intermittent fasting into your life. This could be daily. This could be a 24 hour fast once a week. It could be just eating a little earlier at night to give your body time to get into fast and metabolism. That is just as profound for people as the types of foods you're eating. Just getting a, a period of time where your body's not in a constantly fed state is very important. I think we're realizing how important it is to get protein. And that does not mean they need to strictly come from animal-based sources, although those are going to be the most bioavailable ones. Whether you're getting a plant-based or animal-based, we need a good amount of protein. I'd say a good target for people to aim for is probably most people aiming for around 100 grams, 100, maybe 150 grams if you're, if you're very active, a heavier guy, or, or getting more athletic is a good target to aim for every single day. It's going to help you maintain muscle mass and keep you full. Um, and then I think more importantly is how you actually dial this into your unique routine that fits with your work life and your family. So you have a proactive meal timing schedule set up. You typically have go-to meals earlier in the day when you're being productive in the morning. You don't want to have to figure out what you want to have for breakfast. You have a dialed in routine that you can kind of like stick to and you have more variety later in the day. Guys, let me take a minute to tell you about my buddies over at Lead Hub, Ben and Aaron, the best humans I know. Not only are they amazing at marketing for trade companies, but Ben started his HVAC company in his garage, sold it for multi-million dollars. So when this guy talks... I listened. When we took over Deets Mechanical, we had 22 reviews in 22 years. In seven short months, we went from 22 reviews to 107. We went from a 4.2 to a 4.7. We tripled our Facebook presence and we tripled our calls. If you're an HVAC, plumbing, electric, landscaping company, and you're looking for a no BS approach to marketing, you're looking for people who have done it before, you got to go to leadhub.net. When I watched a video, <clears throat> a documentary on uh, Amazon Prime about fasting. They were uh, they brought a bunch of people to this place in Italy, and this person was on sixty four um, uh, sixty four medicines per day, mm -hmm. and they just did a thirty day program of some fasting and some juicing and everything. And by the end of it, they were all they were off of it, right? So mm -hmm. then I get intrigued and I start doing you know intermittent fasting, and I've done three days, and I've done I've done all the things. I do like twenty four hours every week. Good and. You're talking to a guy who beat drugs and alcohol, and the things that I say to myself subconsciously and the habits that I have when I'm fasting are wild to me, and it makes me realize how much of eating and consuming you know bad foods is really not done on a conscious level. Yeah, and it's so wild to me how these things are ingrained in us. It's twelve o'clock. We gotta eat. Sure. And then you like breathe for a second do some deep breaths and like that it passes mm -hmm. and you're like, fine. Like most people haven't even done that. They haven't even like skipped a meal. <laughs> like for ever. sure. But like, so it's, if it's fascinating how we like, we like, we treat all our different emotions in a such a different way than this hunger signal that comes up when this arises. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you're right. It's not physiologic hunger. It's not your stomach's grumbling. It's just habitual. You can say it's more appetite than hunger. And we just merge with that. We constantly serve that every time we feel that. And that's one of the beautiful things about fasting and also why it's been a longstanding spiritual practice in pretty much every religious tradition, because it creates some space between that normal stimulus and the response. And 
It allows you to be more aware of things that arise. It makes you less reactive generally. And I'm telling you, there's a massive correlation right now between people's overeating and the fact that we have these technology things, these little dopamine drains that are constantly hitting us and buzzing us and getting us to like react to every little bit of impulse that we have. Oh, keep on scrolling. Oh, check this video out. Oh, that out. Oh, I'm actually hungry. Let me go to the kitchen and get that. Then the blood sugar gets on a tailspin. So the way we actually start with people in these programs is like, you got to first establish a structured meal timing schedule. So you know when you're going to eat so you can make it proactive instead of reactive and you stop snacking. Like this was bad nutrition advice over the last 15, 20 years where we told everyone to eat small, frequent meals, do the snacking all the time. turns out that just dysregulates your blood sugar, increases your hunger hormones, and it's far better for you to have a couple discrete feedings with longer periods in between. So for someone, this might be if they have a family, breakfast with the family at eight, lunch at noon, snack at three, dinner at six or seven. Like that's a fine setup. That works great. Um, it could be intermittent fasting where you shift that first meal back to like 10, 30, 11, and you have a go-to standardized meal that you can hook into every day. This could be some kind of eggs and avocado with berries. It could be some kind of power smoothie you make. But I, I want to urge everyone here, if they do not have a dialed in meal number one, morning routine or whatever they do with that first meal, standardize that. Because imagine if you're going to eat two, three meals a day for the rest of your life, how would it serve your high performance and your energy to standardize that first meal of the day, get that locked in? One third of your meals are kind of handled for the most part. This meal gives you energy. It doesn't drain your willpower. You don't have to think about it and you get all your good nutrients in and set you up for more positive momentum later in the day. Like that is the behavioral success. Everyone I know that's massively successful with their nutrition long-term has this mix of standardization with variety later in the day. And what, since you've studied it way more than I have, and you have a more of a technical understanding, like, um, when I have like a busy morning or like, I won't eat at like three the prior day and I won't eat mm -hmm. till like 12 or three the next mm -hmm. day sometimes so like once a time a week. Mm -hmm. And I typically do it when I have a really busy morning, like a, mm -hmm. like four coaching clients in the morning. Why do I personally feel sharper and more dialed in when I am, haven't eaten. And then when I do eat in the morning, I, I feel sluggish. Mm -hmm. And is that because of what I'm eating or what's the mechanics, the scientific mechanics behind it? There's a couple, a couple of degrees of mechanics. One, uh, the, there's the brain regions that control hunger and appetite, particularly working through hormones like leptin and ghrelin are also closely tied to our alertness centers. And there might be like a biological evolutionary kind of basis of this, that the human mind, the human brain gets a little sharper when there's food scarcity that might help us to like really navigate the environment and find some food. That's just like a, a theoretical explanation people have thrown out for why we get sharper during that period of time. Two, your blood sugar levels are stable. Like your body's actually very good at keeping your blood sugar levels stable during fasted periods. And in the morning, we get this natural rise of cortisol. It's part of our circadian rhythm. Cortisol makes us more alert, increases our blood sugar and our blood pressure. It liberates some of those, those stored carbohydrates in our liver. So you have plenty of like energy that's getting access through your body's natural circadian hormones is the second aspect. The third aspect is every time you eat, your brain and your digestive system are in a tug of war battle for blood flow. And so when we had the experience of having a huge meal and all that blood rushes to our stomach to begin digestion, we yawn, we get tired, we want to take a nap. It's like the post Thanksgiving feast kind of scenario because that blood is literally being shunted from your brain into your GI tract to have this kind of circulation and, and, and it helps digestion. So heavier, harder to digest foods put more digestive stress on the body, which actually like kind of robs you of some of your energy because your body has to divert energy and resources to digestion. And when you fast, you don't have to do that. So long story short is you have great blood flow to your brain, you have stable blood sugar levels, and some of those brain areas actually increase in alertness when, you know, when you're not eating. Uh, and you actually, when you fast for longer, not just like skipping breakfast, it actually helps regenerate the brain. It increases a, a compound in the brain called BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor that actually helps rebuild new neurons. And so we're seeing right now with everyone having cognitive decline and dementia, and this is happening to our parents, and we're seeing it happen just as an epidemic right now. This is largely driven by the fact that we have people who have had really poor metabolic health, high blood sugar all the time, insulin resistance in the brain. It's the exact opposite experience of the alert fasted brain. So I think it's a nice, it's a nice time for people to either have light, easy to digest meals in the morning, mm -hmm. like so 
lower carb meals in the morning are a great idea. You do not want to eat a lot of carbs in the morning to show your blood, throw your blood sugar in a tailspin. So this could be an egg based recipe with some avocado. It's okay to have a little bit of like some lower sugar, lower GI uh, fruit, like some berries could be fine. Make a power smoothie with your favorite protein powder, some wild berries, some greens in there, whatever else you want to throw in there. There's, there's many good things I could mention, but all these things are going to give you nutrients. They're easy to digest. I mean, let's just talk about a power smoothie. Like it's like kind of pre-digested, very bioavailable nutrition, or you can just fast. But either way, eat light during the times when you're going to be in your productive work blocks. And then actually when you want to shift your body into more relaxed time, this is when you can have more food. You can have higher carbohydrates, which increases serotonin in the brain. It makes you feel like more relaxed and connected. So thinking about your nutrition now that you're timing it to with a state that you want to feel is a very liberating and empowering concept. And, and totally and to take it one step further, like are certain um, diversities of food, like perfect example, and I'll just use it. I've never felt heavy or full eating Greek food. Mm -hmm. I don't under, like, why is, and I'm not talking about Greek food in Greece. I'm talking about like Greek food in the States. Like is certain foods, like uh, I had pho for lunch today. Like mm -hmm. I don't feel heavy. I feel light. I feel mm -hmm. like I could run like, you know, I think that we're not paying attention to the type of diets or past like processed food. We're not even paying attention to what's actually going in our body. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. And I think that, that that subjective sense of lightness is what you want to feel when your system is running well. Because we all know the converse of feeling heavy, like there's a stone in your stomach, there's bloating and digestion, you feel sluggish and lethargic afterwards, like what those there are some foods that will generally cause that for like most people like if you gave people a lot of wheat and a lot of cheese like all at once or mm -hmm. and, and let alone throw in some like dense animal protein like steak most people are going to feel heavy with that period of combination and so i think it is for us all to like be become more aware of like which foods make us feel lighter um and for some people there might be some variety like some people feel lighter or heavier on different things. And this comes down to the fact that we have different, different gut microbiomes that break down foods slightly differently. And it sounds like you've, you've dialed in your recipe and I'm not sure what Greek food means to you. If that's like chicken and hummus and feta yeah, and chicken, like, hummus, feta, uh, fresh vegetables, like, you know, the, the typical, like I ate the same thing for like two years when mm -hmm. I started getting, losing weight. Cause I was just super busy. Right. And I always never felt like, but anytime I've gone to a Greek restaurant, chicken, hummus, uh, fresh vegetables, uh, fruit. I mean, that sounds stupid to say out because it's like, oh, that's just obvious. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but that was till I met my fiance. Like, I didn't pay attention to like, hey, I ate this food. I feel this way. And now mm -hmm. I do. I'm like, oh, I got to stay away from that. Like, we don't do gluten, you know, anymore. Yep. Like those kind of things. Like, you know, it, it, I mean, it just sounds ridiculous, but I never did pay attention to like, oh, I ate that and I feel this way. Uh, but now you can kind of catch it and you're like, okay, like I, you know, and I think having the ability, right, for me, and just because I'm a studier of mindsets, um, I find the mental fortitude that fasting gives you, I, I, I don't think there's anything, I haven't found anything better to mm -hmm. build up how strong you feel than like breathing through hunger and then like taking, I really, I really haven't personally. For sure. And, it, and what is fasting, but the ultimate experience of that extended lightness, and that extended mm -hmm. sharpness, as well as mm -hmm. retraining your mind, because every time you feel that hunger signal or the appetite signal or the craving come up, you can observe it. And that's literally just a neural groove, a neural pattern that's been patterned over and over by every time in the past that you've responded immediately to that snack or done this kind of thing. And the brain can be retrained. Those, mm -hmm. those habits and patterns can be retrained through observation. So that's why I think this fasting concept is, is so intimately tied to what we describe as spirituality or even like mindfulness. It, it gives mm -hmm. you the space to really observe and be open. And then you can become free. Because I think the experience that we do want with our health is we have a body that is light and energized, consistent energy to do things. And we're not a slave to any of these things that used to kind of trap us. Those are either our bad habits with alcohol in your case and other things mm -hmm. or food, which is the more socially acceptable version of this. Um, and I'll say this too. I think a big reason why people struggle so much with their health is that it's socially acceptable to use unhealthy habits as a way to like self-medicate and to deal with our stress. Mm -hmm. So we all have stress, especially if we're pushing and we're going to high performance. And in fact, like part of life is to stress ourselves and, and to get stronger as a result of challenge and to increase our bandwidth. But if we unfortunately are using food as a way to medicate and change our neurochemistry, like 
that is ultimately going to be a, a vicious cycle that never gives us to the level of success and performance we could be because we're actually like toxifying our body in the short term, thinking that we're doing good and managing our emotions in the long term. And this is why movement is the medicine, particularly movement outside. It's what humans are, are meant and designed to do. It is the greatest tap into your neurochemistry to help you feel better. So if you can start to translate for you the the chemistry that you were getting from the alcohol, you know, benders, and now you start to actually walk and get different connection and neurochemistry through activity, like that could be your pressure release valve, among other things like, you know, obviously the sunshine, the good friends, the meaningful conversations and, and all that. Um, but yeah, we got to find healthier pressure release valves. And I think exercise is where that actually fits in. Perfect segue. So I have changed, you know, I'm, I'm 41 now, I just turned 41 last month. So you work with many people, you know, over 40 uh, mm -hmm. moms and, and dads. And your, I think that at least for me, and, and I only use my example. When I was when I was twenty, or I was in high school, and you you have these football coaches and baseball coaches, and um, I can't stand the way they didn't know what they were talking about. Period. And then when you go into a gym, you see these people doing the same stupid workouts for so long. Yeah. Like I am not in the business of working out so my biceps look big. I mm -hmm. am I am in the business of working out for the rest of my life. Yep. So I can be fit and happy at 70, 80, 90. Like my, my sure. grandmother works out. She, she plays golf. She's amazing at her age. Like when you, when you bring on these clients, are you having to spend 90% of your time just reworking bad habits that they picked up from, from bad, you know, uh, working out instructions as they've got over the years? Or are you just going back from, from starting from one? I, I think that we, we all just have bad memories of like how to work out and, and what actually is working out. For sure. Yeah. I mean, there's a degree of retreading, but like, I, I don't have that experience of, it feels like I'm spending all of my time undoing people's bad habits, impressions, and patterns. Yeah. Like what we do teach is like the first thing your body needs is daily movement. So you got to check your movement box every day, whether or not you have a formal scheduled workout, which should be things that are in your calendar, like meetings, like, and, and the cool thing is after 40, it's not like you need to be doing strength training or cardio training, like every single day, it could be to, to your desire and the amount of tolerance, but even pulses of the proper strength training twice a week for 30 minutes a session is like a million times better than zero. And we teach people how to strength train properly, but we get people to daily walk and check the moving box every single day as the baseline. And there's a lot of great times where you can incorporate this into your meetings or into your family time. Maybe it's a walk with your dog in the morning. Maybe the family goes on a walk, weather permitting after dinner as of some good connected time. Maybe you're walking in between like work breaks, getting outside, breathing, resetting your nervous system. So getting it so that movement is just like the backdrop of your day that you move more is the first important thing to do. The second aspect is when it comes to exercise, particularly people who are now at a mindset where they're not looking for stress aesthetics, but they want longevity is we have three aspects of fitness that we need to work on. We need the strength and muscle, which we want to carry more muscle mass into we, as we age, because that improves our metabolism and it's highly associated with longevity. So we need to strength train. We need a good cardiovascular fitness. The number one killer of humans worldwide is heart disease. And that has become the heart becomes weak because we eat inflammatory diets and the heart is unhealthy. So we need a cardio training with the strength training. And then we need flexibility and mobility training because I'll, I'll speak for myself. Like when I was a bodybuilder, I was training in like a very dumb linear way that kind of jacked up my body. Even though I looked really fit, I wasn't high performance. I didn't have the mobility or the movement patterns. And we want to be able to be 70, like your, like your grandma, where you can bend down, reach overhead, push and pull things, rotate your trunk. And like, we don't want to have a body that's in pain. So what we do is we train all these three aspects in one time efficient workout. And we call the style of training metabolic resistance training which is the most foundational strength training movements that you need to be able to do. You need to be able to bench press, row, shoulder press, squat, deadlift, swing. Like these foundational movements that the body just naturally knows how to do, we load those. And so you might do a circuit of these kinds of strength training exercises. So you're getting cardio and strength training. And these workouts only take around 30 minutes at the low side, but they can be up to an hour. These workouts are great because they can help you build muscle. You get a lot of density in your workouts. So you get in there for like 30 to 45 minutes and you have a phenomenally effective session. And that's not to say that you can't go to a gym and like do a set of bench press and rest three minutes and check your phone and do another set. It, it can be helpful for muscle building, but it's not the most effective way for people to train. And I love these kind of hybrid workouts because you get a lot of density, you get a lot of blood flow, you get the cardio and the strength all in one. So we teach people how to do this. We help them schedule these out. You know, at first when they're starting out, it might only be like 
once or twice a week, but they might build up to doing this three times per week with some other kind of play and free exercise on the off days. Um, but I think it's important that people get in the habit of like looking at these exercise and workouts as things they schedule on the calendar. Like you scheduled this podcast meeting with me, me with you, but there's also like a workout on the calendar as well. And that's set ahead of time. So you're like paving the path to your success and you know when you're going to do it, what you're going to do. And there's more clarity there. Cause I think if there's too much ambiguity with this exercise thing, you're just going to be like, ah, oh, I got busy today and I didn't do it. And then that creates negative momentum that cascades on for the rest of the week. Oh, I love it. We carry, we covered the nutrition, we covered the exercise. Now I want to take it in a different direction because I'm just a curious person. Mm -hmm. So you what aspect of your business, right? You're coming on here, you're sharing your story, you, you have these big groups, you've, you've helped all these people. Like when you're laying down at night and you're um, looking at what you created, what are you, what, what, what keeps you going? But more importantly, like what, what excites you the most about this thing that you didn't know you were going to get into, but then it's become this big movement and you have all these clients. Like what, what are you like? I know it's a weird question, but like, what are you proud no. of? Cause it's like a wild, it's a wild journey to, to help that many people. I think that what I've discovered through my own personal healing journey, which kind of in summation is my dad passes. I realize how important health is. I spend my life building up my body, which was from, I guess, a personal place of like wanting to heal. And also through some vanity, I had a series of life experiences where I broke my body down and realized that our health is so much more than just our physical, it's our mental and emotional. And so to kind of dovetail into your question, what I'm most excited about is I believe that all of us here are looking to have this maximized life experience where we can be the greatest version of ourselves, the most connected with our family, the most expressed in whatever we're creating. And that like health is literally like the body vehicle through which we can do all of this. And for me now, as I've gotten so much more spiritual, and I'll, I'll just say this, I'm a Christian, like it has been so powerful for me to see the interplay between like how my deepest connection to my faith and my most fundamental values about like what life is about, what love is about, what goodness is about, is all cultivated through a healthy body, that these things are inextricable. Like the one who has a body that is not quite there, it's not quite whole, it's not quite optimized, inherently in the fact that the body is not in this whole healed state, has things that are unhealed in their psyche, in their life, in their relationships to their habits, in the, in the things that are trapping them and keeping them stuck. And the, the journey that we're all taking to become the most whole and express version of ourselves comes through this whole integration. So I'm not just excited about the fact that I help people do more squats and eat more vegetables and fruits and all these kinds of things. I'm helping about the fact that in a subtle way, especially for parents who now want to be around for their kids and to create legacy, this path of getting yourself physically healthier is one of the most profound mental, emotional, and spiritual journeys that anyone can take towards wholeness. And the beautiful thing about the body too, is insofar as we work and we strive to help it become more healthy, strong, and robust, and it's a, it's a spiritual experience in doing that. What really makes it spiritual for me is that we must lay these bodies down at the end. No matter what you do with this thing, however, how hard you try, even the billionaires are dying and they have access to everything. So there's this beautiful aspect of like working and, and being in good utility and being in, in natural law and creating, and then the surrender of realizing that these bodies are temporary too. So it's helping people go through this whole dance and trajectory and also maybe running, running a different current than our sick mainstream society that has made people weak and dependent on, you know, unhealthy food, prescription medications and all that. I think there's a cultural shift that needs to be made. And then on the final layer of the question is like the kids. We literally right living today have the first generation of kids that are not expected to live longer than their parents. We have kids with childhood diabetes. We have kids that are addicted to phones. We are inundated with non-native EMF all over the place. Like we're moving in a direction where people are getting less healthy. And I, and I, and I know I'm not the only one that is so passionate about screaming about this, but I want to use my, my time and work to help reach the next generation too, so that we can like steer this, this course in a different direction. I love that. I think that my fiance <laughs> who's super spiritual uh, has taught me because I'm a, I'm a giver. I, I help a lot of people get sober. I've, I've coached a lot of people. I have a lot of employees. I want to see them succeed, but I can't do those things if I'm not internally mm -hmm. healthy. And I never correlated until recently that me not taking care of myself, whether it be my skin, my health, 
um, you know, taking time for myself is me not truly loving myself completely. Mm -hmm. And sure. it sounds ridiculous to say, say because you're like, well, I'm helping all these other people. But like, if you're not helping yourself, then how can you continue to help more people? And I wish people would take this health journey, this, 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 the, the things that consume that they, they put in their body, whether it be podcast, food, all the things, your environment, um, they all add up to this kind of full menu of, of how you care about yourself and put yourself out there in the universe. I, I couldn't agree more. And I also think there's a degree of power that you get when you are in the greatest level of integrity, when you're mm -hmm. aligned with your mission, your purpose, you're aligned with serving people and doing well, and your body is being taken care of in a great way on top of that. Like mm -hmm. you gain a degree of power, like internally through your own conviction that you're actually like expressing on all these levels externally in terms of how people perceive you when you have that level of alignment. But I think there's even something deeper, a little more like psycho spiritual, where you become really aligned with your word, the things you say you're going to do, you actually do, you follow through, you're working and like all these levels are, are aligned. I think some really powerful stuff happens. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's this journey of wholeness that we're all taking. It's awesome. If people want to track you down, they want to find out more information, how would they do that? So Fit Father Project is our men's health company. You can find it at the website fitfatherproject.com. Um, and Fit Mother Project is our women's company, fitmotherproject.com. And on those websites, we have free meal plans, workouts, as well as like free two-week trials to our program and our app. And if you're someone who likes also like videos and stuff, I mean, we have amazing YouTube channels for Fit Father Project and Fit Mother Project. You can check those out as well and connect deeper with what we're doing. And I, I guess like in, in a nutshell, it's like what we do is we give people the simple and sustainable health plan. Like you wake up, you drink water. Here are some great breakfast options to have. Here are the healthy snacks. Here's the menu when you're out in the world of the healthy things to order. Here's some workouts to follow. And we put you in community with myself, with our coaches, and with all the other people on this program. So we actually keep you accountable in the process. So it's like a one-stop shop for every mom or dad who wants to be healthy. It's a health program, app, community, and it's facilitated by me and my team. We're walking with you through this journey. And it ends up being something even deeper than health. Yes, we get you ridiculously physically healthy, but you also just start to live a more aligned life you have more energy you have more joy and connection with your family you're a greater role model like this is what we're doing at fit father project and fit mother project i love it guys if you got some value from this episode send it to a friend that will get some too rate us and review us and we'll see you next time